So I'm Professor James Kilner. I run a research group at the Institute of Neurology at the University College London. And part of my research is interested in uh, some of the movement disorders of Parkinson's disease, in particular, the sort of uh, the bradykinesia, the slowing of the movement and the uh, difficulty in initiating movements that characterise some of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. I did my, my PhD uh, 1996 to 2000, and that was on uh, the human motor system, and in particular, signature of brain activity. So a key signature of people with Parkinson's disease is that within areas of the basal ganglia, particular the subthalamic nucleus, uh, they have uh, what we would call pathologically high beta amplitude. So there are studies that have shown that throughout the, the entire motor system, these beta oscillations are greater, not just in that one area, but throughout the motor system. Now, one thing of interest is that this particular brain oscillation at this particular frequency is linked to Parkinson's disease. So it's of a greater amplitude in people with Parkinson's disease. And there's a large body of research trying to work out why that signal is greater, whether it's the cause of some of the pathology or whether it's a signature of, of the disease. So one thing that seems to be the case is treatments that ameliorate the symptoms of Parkinson's disease seem to have a common pattern in that they reduce this high level of beta oscillations that seem to be some marker of the pathology of Parkinson's disease. If you ameliorate or reduce those beta oscillations, you can make Parkinson's disease patients better in terms of reducing some of their uh, motor symptoms. Obviously, I've always been interested in the motor system. I joined the research group of uh, Professor Carl Friston. So he's one of the leading theoretical neuroscientists in the world. And at the time he was working on a particular theory to try and understand uh, you know, perception and cognition in the human brain. The framework that Carl Friston's put forward is called active inference. And the idea is uh, if you're thinking about how the brain processes information that's coming in, is that it sort of considers the human as a passive agent. In other words, your information is just coming in and then you're trying to make inferences based on what you've learned. The key intuition he put forward is that what you can actually do though, is you can actively sample the world to gather information. So this is rather like treating the human as a, a bit like a scientist, that you might have a hypothesis about what's going on in the world. And instead of waiting for that information to come, you can actively go out and gather that information. Within this framework, the key part of it is that the brain is considered to be predictive so it's trying to predict the sensory inputs that's coming in. And what the brain is interested in is the difference in between what you're predicting and what's coming in. And that's called prediction error. And put simply within this framework, the brain is just trying to minimize prediction error. The sort of added level of complication is that there's different pieces of information that come in. So you have, in the simplest case, a prediction that you're making about the world and then you have your sensory information coming in and you can weight those information differently. So you could either put more emphasis on your prediction or you can make more emphasis on the sensory channel. So to give an example of that, if you're on a foggy day and you're trying to make sense of an object that you can see in the distance, that's obviously quite now quite a noisy visual signal. And in that situation, you, what the model would say is that you put more weight on your prediction Oh, you might think, oh, that looks like a person. And it may be it that you're wrong. When you get closer to it or the visual information gets greater, that turns out to be wrong. So there's this balance between what we would call the top-down predictions and the bottom-up sensory information. And both of those have a weighting. Within the framework, this is called precision. It's just how precise you are or how confident you are about the, uh, the information that's coming in from those two channels. So if you have low sensory weighting, you'd be more likely to go with your predictions and vice versa. The theory puts forward some interesting 
ideas which immediately have resonance in terms of why we initiate movements and it speaks to and potentially why some patient groups here particularly Parkinson's disease might have a difficulty in initiating movements and so really it was around about then that we started thinking about uh, recasting some uh, motor pathologies within inside this framework and in particular at that time uh, I was working quite closely with a colleague Professor Mark Edwards and we were interested in trying to recast different mo- movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease uh, within inside this framework to try and say according to this theory what would cause some of the symptoms of some of the common movement disorders so that was really the beginning of that kind of work was thinking about given this novel framework what predictions would it make about certain things that you would see in uh, say Parkinson's disease why would they have difficulty in initiating movements the reason this becomes interesting in terms of movement is that if you do have a mismatch you can move to try and then sample the world to try and get the information you require to resolve any ambiguities in the system if you have your arm in a particular position you obviously have lots of sensory information coming into the brain that's indicating where you are in space where that limb is in space you may not be consciously aware of it but that information is coming in now if i then think about planning to move my arm to a different location the brain is going to start running a prediction of what the sensory consequences will be of me moving my arm from position A to position B. So your prediction is not where your arm is now, it's where it will be in the future. The idea is that you then move so that you minimize the error in between your prediction and the sensory signal. In other words, you move so that your sensory signal matches the prediction. So a very simple idea would be to say maybe patient groups that have difficulty in moving from one state to another state they have a very high weighting of their current sensory information that makes it difficult then to move out so i sometimes think of this as a a bit like a, a valley if you're trying to get out of a valley if you're in a deeper valley it's much harder to get out what we have proposed that happens when you initiate a movement is effectively you flatten that valley so during the period of motor preparation before you move what you're doing is you're flattening the valley so that it's much easier then to move to a new state now one of the nerves that carries that information is called the median nerve and you can electrically stimulate the uh, median nerve of people superficially externally non-invasively so you just give an electric shock across the median nerve the median nerve discharges that signal goes up to the brain and then there's a signature of that signal arriving at the brain and you can record these signals using eeg devices you get a little wave in the eeg signal and that has been known for many 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 years to be attenuated so it's reduced in amplitude prior to movement so if you're asking people to make movements then that reduces we can recast that within the new framework and say well that would fit because it's saying that if you were to uh, be down weighting your sensory channel if you're basically turning down the volume on it then the amplitude of that signal should be reduced and our prediction at the time was that maybe some of the movement symptoms of parkinson's disease are caused by the fact that that doesn't occur that they're basically stuck in a deep well and it requires much greater effort to move out of it so that's all fine and then what we can do is to say well let's look to see if that signal is also reduced in parkinson's disease patients off medication it's reduced when they're on medication but not reduced when they're off medication so this in terms of initial steps of recasting parkinson's disease as a, a pathology of a failure to downweight your sensory signal that would be the prediction that they should have a difficulty in prior to moving in reducing their sensory signal and that's what we were able to show initially you could argue that potentially parkinson's disease is not a motor disorder it's a disorder of sensory inputs so rather than the output of the system being wrong 
The problem with the system is it's not interpreting the sensory information correctly. Now, in those scenarios, if you have a noisy sensory information coming in, what the brain should do is put more weight on your predictions. So if you've got noisy sensory information because of the pathology, then the brain should be relying more on its predictions rather than on its you know, sensory channel. So that weighting in terms of how the brain's working, this balance between predictions and sensory inputs, it might weight towards staying in the current state where you understand it and not wanting to move out. Okay, so we thought that if you were to introduce noise into the signal through vibration, then maybe that might have the consequence of, the, of down weighting that sensory channel, making movement initiation easier. So we did it with a device that was used for tendon vibrations. So we just applied, if you like, an off the peg device to do that, uh, which was worn at the wrist. And we basically gave vibration to initially to healthy controls. And we found in young, healthy adults, that after vibration, in, on these particular metrics, their movements were faster, uh, which we were surprised at that worked in healthy controls. Uh, we then run several replications of those particular behavioural paradigms and that those results seem robust. And as I said, we, we recast all that within inside this framework as saying, well, we think we've injected noise into the system. The brain's understanding that noise and it's then making movement initiations easier. Now, one thing that we haven't got over yet, although we do see differences between 80 hertz and 20 hertz, is the idea that people think they're getting a treatment and therefore they improve because of that. And that would be something that should wash out quicker. So in other words, if people are having a belief about the thing working and that's what's driving their behavioural change, one would expect that to maybe diminish over time faster than if it's actually a neurophysiological mechanism. And it certainly shouldn't modulate by frequency. Charcot, who discovered Parkinson's disease or was first documenting this disorder, you know, he noticed that patients that travelled to him in a horse and carriage had fewer symptoms than when he went to go and visit them. So he thought there was something about the mode of transport that was causing him to do this. So he built something called a Charcot chair, which was effectively something like a whole body vibration. And because he thought that was, that he noticed that the patients had fewer symptoms if they were visiting him than if he was visiting them. So this sort of thing has a rich history of trying to say, well, these are the observations, and then we can try and work out what's going on in the brain. You will find clinicians that will say, we don't care. Like, if it works, we don't care. In any field, when something is being proposed as a new intervention, I think the key thing is, how do people with Parkinson's disease use the device and do they find it beneficial? What I've come to appreciate is that the key steps are saying, well, let's just see if the device, does it work? And then it's for researchers, you know, coupled with you know, people like yourselves who are making the devices to work out how it's working and how best to make the delivery of whatever mechanism is by which it's working better. Mm -hmm.